All right, it says we're live on Facebook. How's it going, um, Christina? Um, so good, how are you? Good, I think we will give it a second here to let people start to log in, but super excited to be chatting this morning about all things breastfeeding related. Um, yes, me too. Age. All right, um, I think people are starting to tune in. This is exciting. Um, so I, I guess I want to start off by thanking Boppy for hosting this amazing webinar. Uh, it is a crazy world out there right now, y'all. <laughs> and it is, it is uh, I mean, how many times have you heard moms saying that breastfeeding is one of the hardest things they've ever done or one of the things that they're most proud of? That they have ever tried to do in their life yeah. and trying to do the hardest thing ever that is one of the biggest accomplishments of your life at the same time as a global <laughs> pandemic is it's like a double whammy it's a really you're absolutely whammy. right <laughs> yeah you're absolutely right um so uh boppy is in my mind synonymous with breastfeeding they make some of the most amazing breastfeeding products uh you know that you're a great company when your brand name kind of becomes synonymous with the product that you've created. And I think that's totally right. true about the Bobby breastfeeding pillows. Um, and I was a proud user of one myself. So thrilled to be here on the Bobby page. Um, I'm gonna introduce myself and then I'm gonna introduce uh, Christina who is a certified lactation counselor here with us today. Um, and then we are going to start digging into some of the Q&A. Uh, thank you to everybody who submitted questions in advance for the webinar. So uh, I'm Jen Saxton. I'm the founder and CEO of Tot Squad. Tot Squad is a company that connects new parents with all of the services that they need. So whether you're looking for a doula or a lactation consultant or a sleep consultant or a baby proofer or a car seat installer, you can come to Tot Squad and we will help you find and book the best types of services and help that you need. And we are so lucky at Tot Squad that we have an amazing roster of providers like Christina. Um, and so I will let Christina introduce herself a little bit now. Thank you so much. So I am Christina Conti. I am the owner of Latch LA. I am a certified lactation counselor, like you said, and I'm also a mom of three little kids. Um, I became a mom back in 2010 and I've been nursing since then. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, I had a lactation consultant come to my house, you know, a day or two after having my first and she really helped me so much and just inspired me to turn around and provide that same support to families. And so I love helping parents and babies um, on their feeding journey. And I'm so happy to be here talking with you all today. That's awesome. Well, I realized I did my intro and I talked about my business and not about my babies. So <laughs> I'm, like, I'm already winning the award for worst mom ever this morning. Oh my um, God, amazing. <laughs> I always joke that my business actually was my first baby and that Charlotte totally. was my first human child. Um, she's, amazing. <laughs> she's 19 months old. Um, and I just weaned her uh, in January. So we breastfed for uh, 16 months. I, I made it into January. She was born in September. And I was like, okay, I made it from 2018 to 2020. So I'm going there to go. say to her when she's a teenager, I breastfed you for two decades. Um, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> hold it over her head. Um, since we love it. Love it. Um, so uh, it was a, a definitely a challenging journey for me. Um, I think uh, there is kind of a myth out there that breastfeeding just comes naturally to people. And, and I think that there are a lucky few people who really do find that it comes naturally. Sure. Um, but yeah, my sense is that that's probably not true for the majority of women, which is why there's so many questions. So as we start going into this webinar, if you do have questions, please feel free to go ahead and leave them uh, in the chat section. And we will get to those in the second half of the broadcast. Um, so again, for those of you that are just joining us, uh, it's Jen from Tot Squad and Christina from Latched LA here to answer all of your breastfeeding questions uh, in partnership with Bobby today. So Christina, I think one of the most common questions that we hear about is how can I tell if I'm making enough milk? It's, you know, you have no idea what's coming out and if the baby is getting enough. Right. And that's a really great question. And like you said, a lot of parents wonder this um, because we can't see it, right? We can't see it when um, they're nursing at the breast. 
So there are three things that I like to look at um, to make sure that your baby's getting enough milk. And when you can cross all of these off, check them all off, you can rest assured that you're making enough milk. Number one is weight gain. And that's the most important, that your baby is gaining appropriately and steadily. Um, number two, and I like this one a lot because it's something you can keep track of at home and it's diaper output. So once your milk has transitioned from that newborn colostrum to that um, mature breast milk, we would expect to be seeing at least six wet diapers per 24 hours and um, at least three or four stools per 24 hours. And when you have that, um, it's a good sign. It's coming out. We know it's going in. Mm -hmm. And then lastly is meeting milestones. So is your baby meeting all the milestones appropriate for their age? And if yes, that they've got good weight gain, good diaper output and good milestones meeting them all, then you can um, nurse in peace and just <laughs> know that it's going well. <laughs> That's awesome. I actually had a great product uh, when my baby was born called the Hatch Grow, which is a changing pad that's also a scale. I think it might be a little bit controversial because some people can drive themselves crazy with this, but it's yeah. like accurate to the ounce. So you could actually weigh your baby before and after a breastfeeding session to see right. how much milk they're getting. Um, so if you're really nervous, there are products out there. Um, and I have heard of moms that actually go to the pediatrician's office and will nurse the baby so that they can weigh before and after and really get that peace of mind and knowledge yeah. that the baby uh, is eating enough. But I think that, you know, in the absence of those more extreme measures, I, I love your tips. I think that that makes a yeah. lot of sense. Yeah, um, absolutely. So should a new mom nurse from one side or both side at each feeding? So this will vary um, baby to baby and parent to parent. Um, some babies like one side, they latch on, they nurse, and then they've got their whole meal just right there. Some babies like both sides and some babies are going to want to go back and forth for one, two, three, four sides. Um, so I like to just always offer. I like to bring them to the first side. If you're not sure which side to go to, just give yourself a lift. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Whichever feels fuller, start on that side. Um, let them nurse there as long as they want. Um, once they start to slow down, maybe you see them like they're not actively nursing or swallowing anymore. Um, or they're starting to kind of just drift off or they just unlatch, bring them to the other side just to offer it. Maybe they'll take it, maybe they won't. If they don't, then just start them on that side, the next feeding. Totally, I, uh, I remember when my daughter was first born, we were joking that she had IBS instant boob sleepiness. As soon as you put her on the boob, she would like pass out. We're like in the hospital trying all these tricks, putting ice cubes on her little cheeks, trying to get her to wake up yeah. and eat. She's just like, yes. <laughs> some babies, I mean, yep. that's their heaven. Some babies are born super sleepy. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's their happy place. Right. Totally, totally their happy place. And that. the other trick that I often did when I wasn't sure which side I had nursed from um, was actually taking like a little clothespin or something and hooking it right onto my nursing bra. And then you can do it with a ribbon, like you, any sort of clip, hair clip, and just clip it totally. and then move it. Um, so when you're sleep deprived and losing your mind and you really can't remember. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. And when you're nursing frequently, it doesn't really matter. You know, I like, I love your hack, but um, like it's one less thing to worry about even. Do you know what I mean? Like if you're nursing frequently, they're gonna be nursing from both sides all the time, so. Totally, so I guess it, that just makes me wanna ask, what do you think about apps where you're actually tracking which side you fed from and how many minutes? I feel like I was collecting so much data about my baby when she was a newborn and I was like, I, I think there was an Alexa app where I'd be like, Alexa, left boot, five minutes or something. <laughs> I don't know what I did with this information, but I tracked it. Right, um, I think that it can be helpful in the beginning if you, especially if you have a baby who maybe isn't gaining as well or something like that. Like there's there's some sort of yellow or red flag that you really wanna keep extra track of. Mm -hmm. But otherwise I think it can just be one extra thing and can kind of start to get into your head. Like you said, with like the the weighings, every feeding when you have a scale at home. Yeah. So um, I think it can be helpful, but I, I like to say once you've got nursing all figured out and it's you know smooth sailing, delete the app put the scale away and just nurse. You know what I mean? It's just part of your life um, and just easy. 
And I'm just curious, do you have any sense about how long it takes the average mom before she gets to that point where she feels like it's easy? I think I had heard six weeks and for me, it really took 12 um, yeah. and, and, and a lot of resilience to get to that point before I was able to successfully nurse for a longer term. Yeah, that's a great question. I think, um, again, it really varies. Um, I'd say six to 12 weeks mm -hmm. is like the average. Um, yeah. It totally depends. I think that getting support early on, so um, like hooking up with a lactation consultant during pregnancy, so you know how to get the best start possible and then calling them right away. Call them when your baby's born. I think it's really one of the best gifts you can give to yourself and to your baby um, because it's just gonna make it easier sooner. Mm -hmm. I know I was thinking about it because during coronavirus, we're hearing that women are being discharged from the hospital faster. Um, so I was, I had a C-section, so I was in the hospital for four days, but my milk came in 48 hours after my daughter was born, like yeah. with, a, with a full force, I ended up suffering with some oversupply challenges. Right. And I can't even imagine having to go home from the hospital without having the lactation consultants there trying to help me. That, that first night when I came home on day four, I actually got a clogged duct in my armpit. I didn't even know you had milk ducts in your armpits. Oh, they, yeah. yeah, they like sold it to the size of basketballs. It was like, it was so stressful and crazy and scary. And I was so lucky that I was in the hospital and had that support. So are you actually seeing moms coming home from the hospital earlier? Are they getting virtual lactation consultants right now? Or kind of how are they handling that? Wow. Yeah, um, most of the lactation consultants that I know are working virtually right now, myself included. Um, and then going back to that prenatal, I always recommend a prenatal appointment, but right now, especially, I think it's especially helpful because like you said, that in-person support, that hospital lactation support, it's just different right now. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, uh, yeah, just hook up with somebody virtually mm -hmm. and, and well, yeah. just like this, you know? Exactly. I, yeah. I think that there are a lot of different styles. Like even in the hospital, I had different nurses giving me different conflicting breastfeeding advice sometimes, which was really overwhelming. So and I think in hindsight, if I had connected with a lactation consultant while I was still pregnant and felt like I had somebody that I personally trusted and wanted to work with on an ongoing yeah. basis, it would have helped me kind of navigate all of the conflicting advice that I was getting. Yeah. Yeah. That can be really challenging for parents when they're getting different lactation advice from so many different sources. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to remember that um, nurses, doctors, um, all of these people are so amazing and so trained in so many things, but unless they've gone out and gotten lactation training on their own, it's not really a part of their base training mm -hmm. that they go through. So I think um, for lactation support, it's always good to go to a lactation profession. Yeah. I mean, I think that the, the nurse in the recovery room or someone had given me a nipple shield right after the baby was born. And then she came back in later and was like, wait, we're not supposed to give nipple shields the first <laughs> baby's born. And then they took it away. And then I was like, am I supposed to use it? Am I not? It hurts. I don't know what I'm doing. Right. It was really stressful. So I, I think that's yeah. a great takeaway. Um, I just, while I'm thinking about the hospital experience, it's also reminding me another piece of advice I got that I thought was great, which was to actually bring my breast pump with me to the hospital so that I could learn how to use it. Because I think that a lot of people get it off the registry or they order it from their insurance and it's like sitting there in your house and it's like a lot of parts and pieces and contraptions. And it's like really kind of scary and overwhelming trying to figure out what to do with that and being able to like have somebody there in the hospital show you how to use it the first time, I think yeah. was really helpful for me. Um, yeah. Have you seen people doing that? <laughs> I, was like, that yeah, was I think that's a great idea. And I also, you know, there's a video for everything. Mm -hmm. So I would say if somebody is, um, if they've got their pump and they're not sure how to use it, just go ahead and look it up, you know, how to use my pump, whatever kind it is. And, you know, there are so many how to's out there mm -hmm. but bringing it to the hospital too, to get that hands-on help is a great idea. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I think they have like these hospital grade pumps, which maybe are stronger or whatever in the hospital. And they actually sent us home with all of the accessories. Um, so that was great. Yeah. Uh, Cause it was the same That's brand that I had at home, which I loved. Um, so uh, Laura from Texas had asked in advance, do I have to nurse at night? Well, Laura, you don't have to do anything you don't want to do, right? <laughs> um, 
But I would say, let's look at your goals. What are your feeding goals with your baby? If it is to exclusively breastfeed and to create and maintain a full supply that meets all of your baby's needs, then I would say nursing at night is really important and a really good idea. Um, so the way milk making works is we have this hormone, just a really basic explanation. We have this hormone called prolactin that makes the milk. And from about midnight to like five or 6 a.m., it's actually at its highest level. So it's just sort of designed for our babies to get a really large portion of their breast milk, their daily intake breast milk overnight. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we do that, they often, you know, have the full supply that they need. But when we start skipping night feedings um, and milk removals at night, then our body's like, so wait, this is when I'm really excited to make milk and you're not doing it. So do we really want to do this? Is this something I should really put a lot of effort into, a lot of energy into? Um, so if nursing is um, a big priority for you, then I would continue to do it. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, it was about seven days after my baby was born before I got a four hour stretch of sleep at night. Mm -hmm. That made the world's biggest difference. Yeah. Like this is advice I now give to all new dads is like help your wife get four straight hours as quickly as possible because like it, it, it is a world of difference between two or three hours and four hours um, and getting like one pumping session in so that you can get that extra um, little bit of sleep to get that full four hour straight chunk. Like it's a game changer in the early days. Yeah. But I think my daughter was still nursing at night until she was one and I'm counting 5 a.m. at night because I don't normally wake up at 5 a.m. But oh. when she turned one is when I finally got rid of that last 5 a.m. feeding. Um, but it, it took a long time. But I think yeah. that, that kind of brings to mind the point that breastfeeding exclusively is either not an option or not a goal for all moms. And I think that there can sometimes be a stigma that lactation consultants are only pro breastfeeding and they won't actually help you with choosing formula or introducing formula or like navigating formula. Like, what is that? Like, can you just talk about that myth? Because I think that that is a perception that's out there. Yeah, of course. So um, a lactation consultant is going to take your goal in mind and help you create a plan to get there. So whatever you want to do, um, we'll help you with that. Mm -hmm. um, we do, of course, know that, you know, research shows that being exclusively breastfed for the first six months of life um, and then continuing to nurse uh, after introducing solids is what supports the best health for a baby. But it's not all or nothing, right? It doesn't have to be black or white. So like I said, just just you figure out what you want to do, how you want to feed your baby, and we'll help you create a plan for that. Yeah, exactly. Fed is best. Um, and, and it was funny. I don't know why when I was pregnant, I was terrified that I would not be able to breastfeed, which is ironic since I ended up having an oversupply, which is like its whole own category of right. problems. Yeah. Um, and, and so I was like totally pro formula. I was like, I'm probably going to have to use formula. Like I, I'm just, I'm not going to be able to breastfeed. I know I, I'm going to be totally fine with it. And then once I was like really into breastfeeding and, and learning about the mechanics of how the body works, that in order to keep up your supply, you have to be breastfeeding all the time and keep going. Absolutely. Then it was almost like I became afraid to introduce formula over time. And then I almost felt like, like being pro breastfeeding was almost like a negative or something. Like I absolutely in my heart and believe that is best. But it, I think that the mommy wars out there could just be like another element of challenges when it comes to breastfeeding. This idea that you can either be shamed for using formula or exclusively breastfeeding. Right. And I think like what you and I would both want to say to all moms is like, do what's best for your mental health and for your family and for your baby. And no one way of raising your child is the right way or the best way. There's only what's best for the two of you. So treat other moms with that kindness and that empathy that their situation might be different from yours. Do you have anything to of add course. to that? Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, there's only two people involved in a feeding relationship and that's the you know, parent, the mother and the baby. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's totally up to them, of course. And I would say also, um, just for the fed is best, I would say fed is minimum, right? Like fed is a must. Um, I think support is best. So having the support you need, 
to reach your goals and um, have all the information that mm-hmm. helps you make the choice that's best for your family. Yeah, absolutely. And and I'll give you a quick shout out, Christina, because Christina runs a, a great local group here in Los Angeles called Latched LA um, Breastfeeding Group. And I joined that right after Charlotte was born. And it was great to be able to go in and ask what I thought were dumb questions when I was like Googling and, and trying to find all the answers. And then having a, a bit of a tribe of other nursing moms around me to be able to get answers. And then of course, Christina will chime in sometimes um, as well, which was awesome. So I definitely recommend moms to to find a village and a support group that can answer the questions for you on a day-to-day basis, even if it's like not something you necessarily need to go all the way to a lactation consult for. Thank um, you so much. Yeah. yeah, anybody's welcome to join that group. Any, any you know, parent is welcome to join. Whether they're in LA or not, you're welcome. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. There are parents from all over the world in there, which is really cool. That's awesome. Um, so I think that uh, since we're talking about folks who sometimes struggle with supply, I think that it's a really common question. Um, how can I increase my milk supply? Um, I know I've heard about different bars and you know all of these like home remedy types of things, but I would love to hear your expert opinion about how to increase milk supply. Yeah, um, I think really understanding how milk is made is what's going to help you most. So milk is made on a supply and demand basis. And that means the more you ask your body for milk, in other words, by nursing or pumping, um, the more it will make. So if you want to make more milk, uh, just remove more milk. So empty breast will actually make more milk. When they are full for long periods of time with milk, with milk, um, your body will say, oh, maybe this isn't something we want to do. You know, you're kind of just letting it sit there. So nurse very frequently, um, nurse from, you know, offer both sides at each feeding, make sure you're nursing at night as well. Um, and, and then if you've increased, you're nursing at least eight to 12 times per 24 hours, and you're still not sure if you're making enough milk, then I would go ahead and, you know, hook up with a professional. That way you can um, pinpoint what's going on mm-hmm. and, and create a plan that will help you create the perfect supply for your baby. So you don't think there's like a magic protein bar out there that will make you make more milk? <laughs> I mean, I think that they're a fun treat and parents deserve treats, right? Um, but I do, I do uh, believe in the power of galactagogues. Those are, that's any food substance that um, supports lactation. So I do believe in those, but each person based on their own body, you know, what their hormones are doing and whatnot, um, there are different galactagogues that are specific for them. So I wouldn't mm-hmm. just start kind of taking things. Mm-hmm. I would um, hook up with a professional to and what about, find the right one. Yeah, what about like Guinness beer? What is the deal with Guinness beer? Why do people think that helps breastfeeding? <laughs> you know, there's people say that it can um, increase your milk supply, but I, I wouldn't go to that. I wouldn't, um, <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't. <laughs> Um, choose that as my galactagog of choice. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, I mean, I guess that also brings to question uh, a question that a lot of new moms have in the coronavirus era um, when they just want a glass of wine. Is it safe to have a drink while you're breastfeeding? Yeah, so um, it is. It's it's safe to, to have a drink. I, I'm going to give a shout out to the podcast, um, Badass Breastfeeding Podcast. They have an awesome episode on breastfeeding and alcohol. I listen to it. I share it with people. It's really, they break down all the numbers. Like if you've had this much, this much is like this much alcohol is actually getting into your milk. Um, And it's a very, very small amount. So I wouldn't go ahead and get totally like really drunk. But what they say is, um, if you're, you know, some people agree with this and some disagree, but I like to think if you're sober enough to drive, then, um, you're sober enough to breastfeed. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was thinking about it and I'm like, okay, if I have this one glass of wine, it's got to go through my acidic digestive system into my bloodstream, into my breast milk, then into the baby's acidic digestive system before it gets into her bloodstream. Like by then it's just such a tiny little percentage amount that absolutely. Um, I felt okay to have a glass of wine here or there. Yeah. So you know what? I will bust a myth here. Some people think that after they 
breast, uh, no, after they drink alcohol, they have to pump and then dump their breast milk. But as alcohol leaves your blood, it also leaves your milk because our milk is made from our blood. So it will, your breast will detox the alcohol out of the milk all on its own. So you just, you can skip that step. <laughs> no need to pump and dump. You heard it exactly. here, folks. Um, I mean, I have, I've also seen those like breast milk test strips where you can like put it in there. So I guess maybe if you just go back from a weekend in Vegas from a bachelorette party or something, like <laughs> maybe you could I try those, but I've seen people do tests with those and not accurate. Like they have nothing and it comes back positive. So okay. I'd be wary of yeah. those. <laughs> Um, not a good choice. So um, just uh, while we're talking about kind of your diet, are there any other foods that moms should or should not eat that promote, I don't even know if it's like picky eating habits with their future baby or health of themselves and their babies. Like, how do you think about the mom's diet in relation to breastfeeding? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll start with, you said what they should or should not eat. There is nothing that you should not eat. You can eat anything you want when you're breastfeeding. Um, you can have caffeine, you can eat raw fish, you can have garlic and onions and beans and broccoli, all these things. Um, you can have anything you want. Um, I think one thing that's really cool about breastfeeding is that the milk does slightly change flavor based on the food that we eat. So, you know, we often do see that breastfed children have, um, a wider palate, you know, once they start eating solids, they're open to more different foods because they've had so many different flavors. Oh, that's cool. And I think just, um, we will make healthy breast milk regardless of what we eat, mm -hmm. but, um, just, I think it's important to nourish yourself just so that you are energized to be a, you know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, well, I, I will give a shout out to uh, Stephanie Canale, who's a doctor here in Los Angeles, has a great company called Lactation Lab, where you can actually get your breast milk tested right. um, to make sure that there is no um, outside chemicals or anything present if you've been exposed to toxins. Um, but you can also tell you about the calories per ounce in your breast milk. So I did this test and it came back that I guess I don't remember what the standard is, but there's like some calories per ounce that formula is meant to match so that it replaces breast milk. And my milk had less calories per ounce than the target. So she came back and said that I needed to increase my caloric intake. So I was like, wait, 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 you're saying I need to eat more. Uh, I'm into that. And I was not shy. In fact, I was a little sad when I weaned a few months ago because I could no longer be at like, you know, an event where there was a buffet and just be first in line and be like, I'm breastfeeding. I'm Funny. I'm gonna need to eat this food right now. I, mean, I was like, I'm still eating for two. I'm right. breastfeeding. I'm still eating for right. two. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's so funny. that's awesome. And and so is um is there any truth to like the two thousand calories per day extra if you're exclusively breastfeeding or you know I know a lot of people have questions about how breastfeeding impacts weight loss. So I don't know if you want to talk about that at all. Yeah, sure. So um, we do find that we are hungrier when we are lactating, just like when we're pregnant, right? We have an increased appetite. So I think just eating and drinking too, to your appetite um, mm -hmm. is a good idea, you know, unless you have, for some reason, you know, something else going on where you have no appetite or something, but otherwise just eat to your own appetite and that will be perfect for you. Um, and then um, weight loss. I asked about weight, weight loss. Thank you. Um, some people, a lot of people, find that they lose a lot of weight when they're breastfeeding. Not everybody. Some people find that it um, their bodies, you know, don't lose extra weight or or whatever. So it yeah, varies. I, I get the person. sense that it's totally different for everybody. I had a friend who told me she was holding onto this extra ten pounds until she weaned. Yeah. And that happened to me uh, after I weaned in January, I lost 10 pounds and I was thinking it was because I'd been really stressed at work and like, it was just a crazy time. And then I thought back and I was like, oh, actually like that happened right after I weaned. So I think it can be totally different for everybody. Um, it varies. It varies. Yeah. Some people will lose weight. Some people will gain weight. Like it's totally yeah. unique. No, and I rhyme, wouldn't make, no rhyme or reason. Don't count on it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I wouldn't make any lactation choices based on your own body weight. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good piece of advice. So when it comes to solids, um, when do you think, you know, how do you think about introducing solids? When and how should you introduce solids uh, to a breastfed baby? So I would say um, for when to introduce, there is a checklist. 
And when you can check off all of them, then your baby's ready. So the first one is they're at least six months old. The second is they can sit up unassisted um, for a long period of time. So we're talking about your baby's on the floor sitting and you feel comfortable going and you know across the room for 10 minutes and you're not worried about them falling over. Um, and the reason for that is that when they can sit up sturdy, it, it you know lines up with a mature digestive system. Um, they can pick things up with their thumb and forefinger. They lose their tongue thrust reflex. So, you know, we can, a lot of us can picture where somebody's feeding a baby and then they spit it out and then you scoop it back up and put it back in and they spit it out and it's this process, right? Mm -hmm. Of back and forth. So what the baby's doing when they're spitting out is they're protecting their airway. Um, mm -hmm. So once their body is ready for solids, then they will lose that reflex. Mm -hmm. And um, and then lastly, they're interested in solids. So they're watching the food go from table to mouth. They're reaching for it. They're making, they're watching you chew and they're kind of chewing on nothing at the same time. But I would, um, again, keep in mind that it's all of those. So a lot of babies way before they're ready will look really interested in solids, um, but that's just them wanting to explore their environment. And so once you've checked off all those, and in fact, on my, um, on my Instagram page, I have a post that has that checklist. I'll share it um, in my stories today um, for anybody who wants to go back. It's just um, Latched LA on Instagram. And um, so when you're ready, my favorite way to introduce solids is baby led weaning. Mm -hmm. And even though we hear the word weaning, it doesn't have anything to do with less breastfeeding. It's just the term for this type of introducing um, introduction of solids. It's when we will take whole foods. So there's no mashing, there's no baby food. You'll just take whole foods, like a piece of broccoli from your dinner plate um, and put it in front of them. And then they're, it's up to them what they do with it. They can pick it up, they can explore it, they can taste it, they can eat it. Um, you've had a salad for lunch and you put avocado in it. Take a piece that's easy for them, you know, a slice so they can easily pick it up and just put it in front of them and see what they do with it. Mm -hmm. um, I really like this because it gives them a lot of control over their own eating and um, they're not going to wind up over under eating this way and it just sets up healthy eating habits for their whole life because they've always listened to their own body with regards to eating then. Totally. I feel like I'm a baby led weaning dropout. Like I failed at it. <laughs> I, I thought it was like, oh, so great. Right. Um, and, and then I received a gift subscription, um, to yummy, which is a, a, a you know, puree brand that has yeah. uh, different baby food. And it was so much easier. I felt like I was like, not as scared with the choking, but my friends who did successfully do baby led weaning, I think their kids were like eating just such a variety of foods so much earlier. So I, you can't go wrong again um of course anything works. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely, works, absolutely. you but, didn't uh, feel anything you're doing amazing <laughs> totally thank you i appreciate that um so talking a little bit about breastfeeding can sometimes be painful and i think that a shallow latch is sometimes an issue that a lot of people face so do you have any tips for how can a mom get a deep latch is it about the position of of how you're holding the baby or where you're holding the baby or what their mouth looks like. Like, what are the tips for a deep latch? Yeah. Yeah. All of that. So I would say, um, putting them in a position that allows them to easily open their mouth really wide to get that deep latch, um, is, is, you know, your best bet. So I really like, I've got my little baby here. Um, and I really like to do the laid back breastfeeding position, um, one, because it's more comfortable for the nursing parent and two, because it does get a deeper latch. So you're going to just lean back, like you're going to, you know, settle in to watch a movie or something. You lean back and you have your baby right on top of you. So you're not kind of doing this thing. Mm -hmm. You're leaning back. And now what's going to happen is your baby has these nursing instincts that when they are on their belly, they start bobbing around and they can smell and see the nipple, they're gonna bob over to where your nipple is and they're just gonna latch on their own. Mm -hmm. And when we kind of get out of the way and let them do what they know how to do, they do it really well. Um, so that's one, that's the laid back breastfeeding position. And the second thing I would say is regardless of what position you use, so if you're using um, the cradle or cross cradle or football position, or laid back position, make sure the whole front of your baby's body is facing you. So they're not 
Um, I'm going to move my screen a little so you can see my little baby here. So if you bring your baby like this and then bring them to breastfeed, they're going to wind up turning their head, but their baby, their, their belly is still facing up. So it's like they're eating with their head turned. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And that's just uncomfortable and hard to swallow. Mm -hmm. um, so if anybody watching along is drinking or eating right now, you can try it. Just turn your head and try to eat. It's uncomfortable. So um, I would say, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, and if you try to turn back. <laughs> right, right. And if you try to do that for like 20 minutes, you're eventually going to be like, maybe I just don't want to do this or you know, it's just hard and uncomfortable. So make sure that they're totally facing you and make sure that they're pulled enough over to the side that they're reaching up to the nipple. Mm -hmm. So start with their nose across from the nipple. That way, when they tip back to latch, their mouth will line up with the nipple. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, I feel like people are always giving me that advice about the nose and I never really got it. But I think that makes sense is that you so, kind of want to tilt their head back. Yeah. Yeah. So if your baby's over here in the crook of your arm, they have to like tuck their head in. They have to tuck their chin in to mm -hmm. latch. And so again, try to drink your water like this. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You can only open your mouth a little bit, but if your baby's over here, starting with nose across from nipple, they're going to tip up and you can like just physically open your mouth wider that way. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Um, yeah. That's great. And I, I did feel like I had to attend the lactation support groups um, and meet with the lactation consultant several times to get the latch figured out. And I guess yeah. like that brings to mind, I feel like I struggled because of my anatomy. So can you maybe talk a little bit about the anatomy, like of different types of nipples, right? I think we hear about flat nipples and inverted nipples and different types of nipples and how that can impact your breastfeeding relationship. Yeah, of course. So nipples come in all shapes and sizes. And um, I would say, keep in mind that it's called breastfeeding and not nipple feeding. So a baby can really latch on when they're in a good position, um, especially that laid back position to any nipple, right? Whether it's really long and elastic, or if it's flat, or if it's inverted, they can latch on and, and, they kind of like pull it out. So if it's a flatter inverted nipple, their suck will, will, you know, make it work. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, our nipples also get more elastic over time. So somebody who has a flatter nipple, you know, sometimes finds that, you know, a few weeks into breastfeeding, their nipples more averted. Mm -hmm. And there are also little things you could do. So I like to ask a parent who has a flat nipple, well, are there ever any times when it does evert and stick mm -hmm. out? Maybe when you're cold, maybe if you touch it, um, something like that. So then parents can maybe, um, you know, gently stretch and roll it or maybe pump for a minute to help it stick out. Um, but like you said, hooking up with a lactation professional, that way you can work one-on-one -on -one is a great mm -hmm. idea. Yeah, I remember when I was pregnant, uh, I was at the pump station, which is a great um, boutique that's focused on breastfeeding here in Los Angeles. And I, I think I was at the baby care or the breastfeeding class that I took while I was pregnant. And I was like, I'm worried, is my nipple the right shape? And I like went in some back room and like showed some lady my nipple. And I was like, because I remember them saying like, you're gonna be able to like pinch your nipple because it's gonna be like sucked down into the baby's neck. And I'm like, oh my gosh, but mine, like I can't pinch it like that. It was, it was too like firm. And I guess I didn't realize that after the baby was born, like my breast tissue just became so much more soft and elastic and, and malleable, I guess. And that's probably why some people joke that uh, after having babies, their boobs are like socks that uh, can just get thrown over your shoulder or whatever. No. Uh, <laughs> I have no idea how all of that works after breastfeeding, but uh, just got a good bra. <laughs> right. And you know what? It's actually the um, changing of weight, like the pregnancy, and regardless of whether you breastfeed or not, your milk is going to come in at least for a little bit of time. Um, so really, I'd say that's a myth that I'd like to bust, that breastfeeding will not ruin your breast. <laughs> they yeah. might change, but that's more so just the, um, with age and weight changes. Mm-hmm, totally. Gravity. Um, <laughs> So uh, Ariana from Florida had submitted a question in advance about, um, do I need a freezer stash? Um, I do feel like I also felt this immense pressure that I needed to be pumping all the time and creating this freezer stash. So tell us about freezer stashes. 
Right. Um, so we see these online sometimes, you know, we see these pictures, these proud pictures of freezer stashes. So for anybody who doesn't know what that is, it's when you have a lot of milk pumped and stored in your freezer. And I would say that it's almost never necessary. And just one less thing. I like to, if it's not necessary, I like to just put it aside because we already have too much to do. So if we look at the different scenarios of parenting, we'll look at, you know, how much of a stash or at all do they need? So one is the stay at home parent who is just breastfeeding on demand. They're not gonna be leaving their baby for extended periods of time. Um, you don't need to pump at all. You don't need any stored milk, right? You just make it and your baby gets it. Next is parent who's going to be working. And so I would say, all you need is enough milk pumped for like one or maybe two work shifts. And you can start pumping that out the week or so before you start working. And all your baby needs is one to one and a half ounces of breast milk per hour that you're separated. So for an eight hour work shift, um, eight to 12 ounces is all you need. Mm -hmm. And so you just pump enough for that first shift and then maybe, you know, a couple ounces extra if you want, just in case there's spills or anything. Um, and then what's going to happen is that during that shift, you'll pump what you need for your next work day. And it just continues like that. So you'll never need more than one or two days worth, worth of milk in your freezer at a time. The only time that I can think of when you would need um, a real freezer stash is if you do something where you are away from your baby for weeks at a time. Um, maybe, you know, there are people who travel for their work and they'll be away for a week or so at a time and they, yeah, sure, go ahead and, and have, you know, enough breast milk in there for your baby to have uh, while you're away. But yeah, otherwise, I, don't worry about it. I think that's great <laughs> advice. I, I travel so much for, for Tot Squad and uh, my daughter was in seven states by the time she was six months old. Um, so she was on airplanes wow, and that's cool. and going all over the place. Um, and I think a lot of that came yeah. from uh, when she was three months old, we tried to do a 24 hour overnight, just a little like overnight stay in Santa Barbara, which is a short road trip from here. And I got a clogged duct, which turned into mastitis. Um, and then I got a secondary infection oh. related to the antibiotic. And so it ended up being this big saga. And I was like, you know what? It's not worth it being away from the baby. I'm going to like stay very close to her so I don't have to deal with that. So uh, are there any other common issues that parents have when they are breastfeeding and they take time away from the baby? Is mastitis the most common? Or how do you know if you have it? How do you deal with it if you get it? Yeah, good question. I would say that's really um, the most common. So when you're separated from your baby, if you decide to go away for a day or a weekend or whatever, make sure you keep removing milk as frequently as your baby nurses, because otherwise your body's going to keep making that milk and then it's just hanging out stagnant, right? And you can get um, mastitis, which is that inflammation and even infection in your milk ducts. How do you know you have it? Um, some common symptoms are you'll feel like you have like the flu, you're feverish, you're achy. You might have some red streaking on your breast, um, you have a hard tender spot. Um, yeah, and, and so I would say All removing- things, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's no fun, it's no fun. So keep that milk moving um, and then if you, you know, if you're not still removing that milk, just to answer your question further, um, another risk then is a decrease in supply. Because again, going back to that supply and demand, if you take a period of time of not removing milk, your body's like, oh, okay, we don't want to do this. I'll do something else then. <laughs> There's yeah. a lot to do in this body. <laughs> totally. My best travel hack um, that I figured out over time was to have a hand pump. And I didn't really know what that was, but it's like, it doesn't require being plugged into the wall. So I have pumped in the back of Ubers before on the way to the airport. I've used those Mamava pods. While I'm traveling, I've used milk stork to ship breast milk back home, which is an amazing service started by a mom named Kate. Um, you see, you know, there's, there's a lot of great products and services out there that can support you if you do have to take time away from your baby, but you want to keep pumping and keep that supply up um, so that when you yeah. get back to them, it's ready to go. Absolutely.
Um, that is awesome. So um, when it comes to introducing a bottle, I think that um, somebody asked a question, uh, my baby won't take the bottle, what do I do? So this happens sometimes. Um, what you can do is I would say start switching up how you're offering the bottle. Um, sometimes when baby has their um, lactating parent in the same room or trying to offer that bottle, they're like, no, I don't want that. I want it right from tap. You know, I know I can get it from you. They're smart little people. And so sometimes the um, that parent needs to leave the room or sometimes even leave the house because babies can sense. <laughs> somehow that their parent is there and have another adult offer um, the bottle you can offer in different positions so sometimes facing your baby out instead of having them in a nursing position turning them out to offer the bottle walk around bounce them sway let them look at something you know stand up at the window so that they're kind of focusing on that they get a little distracted and aren't you know, super focusing on that bottle that's coming at them. Um, you can bounce if you have like one of those big exercise yoga balls, you mm -hmm. can sit and bounce on that. Sometimes just that movement um, makes it easier for them to accept it. And then um, to prevent it, pre to prevent this from happening at all, if you know that your baby is going to need to take bottles at some point, I would say that there's this sweet spot between three and five or six weeks where they are more apt to accept the bottle. You've had, you know, a month or so to really figure breastfeeding out. You've got that pretty well established at that point, but they aren't past this window yet where they, um, they kind of know what's going on and they're like, no, I don't want it. So offer it within that period of time, three to six weeks, even if you're not going back to work for months, um, offer it in there. And if they take it really easily, then you can give it to them like every other day one bottle every other day. And if it's a little more challenging for them to accept it, I would say give them the bottle once a day so that they know, mm -hmm. okay, this is just something that's gonna be part of my life and I have to deal with. <laughs> right, um, yeah. great. We had a question in the chat from Nicole. Is there any information you can provide in advance of giving birth um, for moms on how they can get ready for breastfeed? Is there anything um, she should or could be doing to help her be successful after the baby arrives? Definitely. I would say the number one thing you can do is um, connect with a lactation consultant, have a prenatal lactation consultation. We will go over everything from, you know, what that first hour is going to look like to how, um, how to get it up and running, right? How to get the best latch, how to create your supply. So I would definitely say work up, uh, hook up with a lactation consultant. Next, find some online groups. Like you said, you know, I have that online breastfeeding group, Latched LA Breastfeeding Support Group on Facebook. Um, find one like that, a La Leche League group. If, you know, if it was a different time and we weren't in the middle of a pandemic, I would say find your local La Leche League group because they're all over the world. Um, but you can actually still reach out and find them because a lot of them are doing virtual support groups like this, which is so cool. And you can go prenatally. Mm -hmm. um, hook up with one of your friends, you know, call a friend and say, hey, you know, a friend who is nursing or who has nursed and say, hey, you know, I'm getting ready to give birth and I'm really excited to nurse. I want to make sure it goes well. Do you have any, you know, tips or tricks that really worked for you in the first days and weeks um, that helped? Um, and then get a good breastfeeding book. Um, yeah. I really love The Womanly Art of Breastfeeding. It's my favorite I have that book too. Yeah, yes. one. Um, and I loved, like my favorite book when I was pregnant was called Expecting Better by Emily Oster. She's an economist from the University of Chicago who basically goes out there and helps dispel myths and like really look at the data and the research around different questions about pregnancy and breastfeeding. She has a sequel that came out last year called Crib Sheet, which I also highly recommend. I've been reading all about potty training now that Charlotte's one and a half trying to figure out how we tackle that. So those are some of my favorite books. Um, nice. All right. Anybody else who has questions, keep putting them in the chat. I'm getting through them. Um, so from Boppy Fan Strength for Spouses, uh, she wants to know, is it true that breastfed babies don't sleep through the night? My baby hasn't slept more than a five hour stint since birth and he's eight months old now. My family has pressured me to put him on formula to solve sleep issues, but my husband and I are standing strong on our breastfeeding stance. We know it's best for him. P.S. He is healthy and gaining weight and all. So I would start by saying, 
you and your husband are doing amazing by sticking to what you know is best for your baby. Um, so that's awesome. I would say um, for your family who's saying formula will help solve sleep problems, that's not true, that's a myth. So you could cross that off. And I would then reassure you that it's totally normal for an eight month old to sleep you know, maybe one long stretch of five hours or so, and then to wake up every few hours throughout the night. Totally normal, totally healthy. As children get older, they naturally sleep longer stretches. Mm -hmm. And it's normal for a child not to fully sleep a whole night until well into toddlerhood. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say, you know, just keep doing what you're doing as right. long as it's working for both of you. Um, and then just jumping back to, um, you know, breastfeeding at night, like somebody asked earlier on, uh, it's important. If you want that full supply, then removing that milk at night is really going to support that. And so do you, um, do you believe in the dream feed? So I don't think I ever really understood. Sorry, there's a siren going by okay. behind me. Um, uh, the dream feed as a way to kind of shift that longer stretch of sleep for the baby to be more aligned with when mom, right? Cause the problem was, okay, if my baby sleeps five hours from like 7 PM to midnight, that's great. But like, I didn't go to bed till 10. So now I only got two hours of sleep. So how do you think about integrating that? Yeah, I think dream feeds are great. So dream feed is when you will, um, nurse your sleeping baby and babies feeding reflexes are so strong that even if they're asleep, if you bring them to your breast, they will very often latch on and have a full feeding without waking up. Um, and so that's really often awesome. Uh, I did that a lot when I was, let's say, I, like you said, going to bed and you know, okay, my baby's gonna wake up for a feeding soon. I would just say, okay, we're getting close to that time. I'm just going to nurse her now so that I can extend my sleep time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's a great way, you know, just to, to get in more night feedings. So yeah. Totally. And, and more sleep for mom, which is always helpful. Yeah. Um, so our next question is, when should I wean? Viewer Grace has a 13 month old and feels pressure to wean soon, but doesn't think her baby is ready. I face the same pressure, Grace. I feel like everybody in my family was constantly like, you're still breastfeeding? Like, when are you gonna give that up? Or like, you know, I don't know. I don't know why like people from older generations um, we like kept questioning, like the fact that I was still breastfeeding. I think Christina knows a whole lot about breastfeeding kids through toddlerhood, um, for families that do want to make that decision. So, um, when should Grace wean, Christina? Well, I think only Grace knows when is right for her and her baby, right? So it's a totally, um, individual decision that you should make on your own. Um, I think that we, you know, it, it's unfortunate that we get a lot of these voices. I don't know why people, you know, family members, friends, strangers on the street want to tell you how and when to feed your baby. Um, just ignore out. them. <laughs> there are two people in your feeding relationship. So just you and your baby. And it's up to the two of you. As long as it's still working out for both of you, if you want to keep nursing, keep nursing. Um, I can give you the official recommendation. So the World Health Organization recommends at least six months of exclusive breastfeeding. That means only breast milk for the first six months, then continue nursing at six months with the introduction of solids and then continue to nurse till two years or longer, they say. So that is the official World Health Organization recommendation. Yeah, and like I said, I weaned my daughter at 16 months and I think eventually she weaned herself. She was no longer, I felt like I was having to wrangle her and cajole her to come breastfeed. Um, right. And I think I might've actually unintentionally driven us to that conclusion because after she was one, like I said, I cut out that 5 a.m. feed and I eventually got it down two or three feedings a day. So I was feeding her before work. I would go to work for a little while. I pumped once at work only. Uh, this is after my daughter was one. Yeah. And then I would come home and I would feed her again at night. And then I found that because I often work late, it was really hard to get home for that nighttime feeding. And so I wanted to drop it down to just the one feeding in the morning. And so I think we did that for like 
three months where I was just nursing her in the morning, first thing when we both got up together. Um, and that was wonderful because I felt like as a squirmy toddler, my daughter walked really early. She took her first steps at nine months. Um, wow. um, and, uh, I, I, I just like, I am so envious of those parents whose kids don't walk until 18 months. Like I wish I was that mom. Right. <laughs> it, was like, it was, it was a lot to That was like my only time the whole day where I could like snuggle with her. So yes. I was so happy that I had those extra three months of, of nursing only in the morning and that worked for us. And then I think probably that made my supply drop a lot because I had stopped breastfeeding so often. So she lost interest because there wasn't as much milk. So it felt like she was weaning herself. She was ready. I was ready. But I think that in my weaning experience, one thing that is not talked about enough um, you hear a lot about postpartum anxiety and depression and, and that there can be a lot of links with the struggles with breastfeeding, driving women into those anxious, um, you know, periods. But yeah. I, I was fortunate. I didn't suffer from that. And I definitely encourage anybody who's having those feelings to seek out help. Um, I think the organization PSI postpartum support international has a great database of maternal mental health experts that can help you. But I actually experienced um, what I believe to be a hormonal depression during weaning, which yeah. you don't hear enough people talking about. I thought like maybe things are just stressful at work and I'm just like, I'm coming home at the end of the day and I'm really tired, like seven o'clock. As soon as the baby's in bed, I just want to be in bed too. I'm just done. Yeah. And in hindsight, I was like, I think this was related to the decrease in my milk supply. Like as my milk supply was drying up and my daughter was weaning, I felt a hormonal depression. So I think there's just not enough discussion about that. So I would keep an eye on yourself if you're noticing that to definitely seek out support yeah. as you go through the weaning process. Yeah, I'm really happy that you brought that up. That is a thing, um, you know, not just postpartum anxiety and depression after birth, but there is that um, weaning anxiety mm -hmm. and depression that can happen. And I think doing it really slowly can help um, but also acknowledging what you're feeling and um, hooking up with a professional, like you said, there is a really big hormonal shift when we um, when we're lactating and then when we stop lactating. Every time we nurse, we have a release of oxytocin. That's what helps the milk flow. And um, some of you might be familiar with oxytocin as the love hormone. It makes us feel relaxed and happy. Um, so, so yeah, I think, um, I, I appreciate you sharing mm -hmm. your story. Yeah, thank you. Um, all right. So we only have four minutes left and I think I have three or four questions left. So we're gonna have to be okay. speedy on these yes. answers. Let's do it. Um, so the first question is my four month old doesn't want to nurse as much. What should I do? So I would say there's two things um, that could be going on here. One, as they get to that age, they do get more efficient. So they might just be nursing less. And if you can check off those three things that we talked about way in the beginning, appropriate weight gain, appropriate day for output and meeting milestones, then just keep nursing on demand. Mm -hmm. um, but there's something else tricky going on at four months. That is the age of distraction, right? Your baby's like, oh my gosh, that light, whoa, that, you know, the way the the glass looks, I don't know, everything. They wanna look and explore everything. So um, we have to get a little more resourceful and insistent around that time. So find like a dark place, free of distraction, go in the room, close the door, close the curtains, keep the pets and the people out and lay down and nurse or get in a carrier, put your baby in a carrier and they'll often nurse in there and it will pass. Yes. Uh, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, from Allison in LA, how can I introduce cow's milk to my one-year-old? We're still nursing, but I want her to have something when I'm not around. Yeah, so I would say um, yay for nursing your toddler. And also uh, you don't have to introduce cow's milk if you don't want to. So you can just nurse when you're together. And then if you want to offer them cow's milk or you know, another milk, a milk alternative or water, just have it available for them with their solids when you're not around, mm -hmm. but it's not necessary. Yeah, I think we introduced cow's milk around one year old, Allison, and we started by just mixing half breast milk with half cow's milk, or maybe it was like a fourth and three fourths and over four bottles. Yeah. Eventually she took a whole bottle of cow's milk and it was pretty easy. But I also remember feeling stressed out about that. Like, what if she rejects it? I don't know. And just wanted right. to know I had the option. So the mixing of the bottles worked for us. 
Um, here's a quick question from Shelby submitted online. Any tips transferring milk from bags to bottles without spilling? I don't want to waste any of my liquid gold. Oh my gosh, Shelby, I felt this too. <laughs> the thing I did was I got the, I think the brand is called Kind, K-I-N-D-E. Is that yeah. how you pronounce it? Mm -hmm. um, and you can actually pump straight into the bag and then feed the baby out of the bag. Like they basically have like a bottle contraption that goes over it. So you never actually have to transfer your milk and they have a storage solution. They even have a little freezer shelf. So I loved that because then I wasn't having to transfer things. But Christina, any other tips from you? Um, yeah, I would say I love that system that you use. That is really great. And um, what you can also do is use uh, either like if you have a little kitchen funnel Put it into the bottle to pour into or you can just use your flange from your mm -hmm. breast pump it mm -hmm. works just like a funnel and so just pour into that and you could do it both ways if you've pumped into bottle and now you need to transfer into your you know little storage bag you can use the flange or vice versa right when you're into the bottle that's great um unfortunately we didn't have time for the last question which was uh, advice for a second time mom that struggled with low supply with the first baby so if that mom is still tuned in right now please just send a direct message to me at hot Squad or to christina at lash la we'd be happy to um, help answer some of those questions for you Absolutely. I, yeah i just want to thank everybody again for tuning in for all of the great questions um and a big thank you to boppy for hosting this session that today so um fun. like i said i am a big fan of the boppy products i uh, i highly recommend them for anybody who wants to check them out. Um, and Christina, thank you so much for being one of the amazing providers that's part of the Tot Squad network uh, and for taking the time out of your busy day as a mom of three <laughs> to join this session today. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for having me. I always love talking about breastfeeding and I love hanging out with you. So thank <laughs> you for having me. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye.